Good morning, everyone. This is TransConnect. I am Dr. Mohit Chaudhary. I am a senior consultant in New Delhi in transfusion medicine and transplant immunology. The topic for today's uh, TransConnect episode is role of molecular techniques in immunometology. Now, this is a very different uh, topic, especially because we have all been dealing with serology for uh, donkey years. But now it is time to move on to molecular techniques, although they have been there for around uh, a decade, but still it has not been practiced in many places. Uh, many uh, reference centers have adopted this technology, but still we need to master it before we start using it and where it is used, it is very important to know that as well. So these are the immunometology discoveries which has happened uh, right from ABO blood group system which uh, was discovered in 1901 and uh, after which R.H. Luthra and Kell, Lewis, Tuffy and Kidd was discovered in 1950s all the way down to DNA based genotyping methods and kits uh, where molecular protocols and RBC phenotyping fails. This happened in around 2000 so it has been there since 2000 and it is uh, high time that we start implementing it and using it for the patient's benefit. So what, a, uh, what is the basic crux behind it? The blood group antigens whether they are like or uh, uh, they are the antigenic determinants on the surface of the red blood cell. They are the ones which cause actually the antibody formation. They can elicit an immune response after a transfusion or a pregnancy event. And uh, aluminization is what happens then. And it is the source of variety of problems during long-term medical and transfusion management. The correct definition of many clinical significant antigen needs to be established. And the identification of appropriate antigen negative RBC for transfusion transfusion is the basic crux where we transfusion medicine specialists need to act on. So since the human pro genome project was uh, done, we have a lot of genetic information and this added a new face in immunometology that is the molecular immunometology. We know now 343 blood group antigens which are clustered in 43 blood group uh, system now this which have been recognized by uh, ISBT and they are now very well known. So serological methods have remained the gold standard for quick routine ABO typing, RSD typing and antibody screening. And we have been relying on hemagglutination and other serological methods that have been proven and well understood for many, many years. Molecular immunometology is the rapidly emerging tool now and it is a critical tool to complement serology. So it is not that it is going to replace it. It is there to complement the serology. So hemagglutination test, it is used to determine the phenotype and predict the genotype of the individuals. Advantages are manifold and most importantly, it is the ease of performance and the low cost. But yes, sensitivity and specificity have been good and that is why it has sustained the time and uh, also the skill and the manpower. The, the technician who is performing it is also very conversant with it and feels that it is a relatively easy test. It is not without limitations because uh, there are so many times when there is uh, donors who have uh, donors blood is there in the uh, circulation of patient and that's why accurate antigen typing of the transfusion patient is often difficult. It is also complicated to type cells when patients RBC have a positive DAT or there is an autoimmune hemolytic anemia and we need to know the underlying allo antibodies and many a times uh, there is lack of automation in hemagglutinations. So what is the way forward? The genotyping method. But to have genotyping methods in place, you should know the genetic background of each major and minor blood group antigens that are there. Every blood group antigen after the human genome project has been typed now and therefore there is a corresponding DNA marker for the same. Most of the genotyping of these blood group phenotype can be deciphered through a single nucleotide polymorphism about which I'll be talking about. Usually the genotyping, genotyping methods are based on the PCR method that is the polymerase chain reaction or the molecular photocopying with the use of GNMI DNA and within the PCR the SSP or the sequence specific polynucleotide or sequence specific primer PCR is the most common. PCR SSP is very cost effective robust method and it is very effective in knowing the blood group antigen. So blood grouping in 21st century, we already know we are talking about DNA techniques and many advances have been made in the DNA. So 
So from DNA to blood group, it is the language of genes. This is a double helical structure of DNA by Watson and Crick. You can see the ATGC or the base here, the nucleotide base. And they are purines and pyrimidines. The purines are the A and the G and the pyrimidines are the T and the C. So DNA, you know, is a nucleic acid composed of both nucleotide bases, a sugar and a phosphate group. So this is uh, how it looks like. You can see the rungs. It's like a ladder and the rungs of the ladder are formed by the uh, nucleotide base. And then you have the sugar and the phosphate group, which acts as a backbone. So you can see there is the three hydrogen bonds are present between G and C and only two hydrogen bonds are present between A and T. So DNA is made of these two strands of polynucleotide which run in anti-parallel direction. So we have been using this term polymorphism. Polymorphism, what is it? It is a many form, literally. That means a set of two or more alternatives of normal phenotypes. So what is genetic polymorphism? When there is occurrence of two or more alleles in a locus in which its frequency is more than 1% in the population. Example, ABO group and MN group. However, if the allele with frequency is less than 1%, it is called as rare variant, like example, O Bombay blood group. So polymorphism uh, can be uh, a, a cause for a lot of changes, and this can uh, be for eye color, hair color, and blood type. It has generally got no uh, negative effect on personal health, but some of them may actually influence the risk of developing certain disorders. So coming to the main group of polymorphism, which is a single nucleotide polymorphism, which is actually the most important one for blood groups, uh, molecular genotyping, and it is the most numerous type of polymorphism in the human genome. There are other polymorphisms which we can uh, safely ignore right now and uh, understand what SNPs are. This consists of variants of single nucleotide position on a chromosome. For example, one individual might have an ATJ uh, base pair at a given position, while another individual at the same base pair may have, same position may have a GC base pair. So that is a polymorphism, that is a single nucleotide polymorphism. Most blood group polymorphism result from one or more SNPs encoding the amino acid substitution in either a glycosyl transferase or the extracellular domain of the membrane protein. In the Duffy system, SNPs, there is an erythrocyte transcription factor binding site in the promoter region of Duffy gene, which is responsible for the Duffy null phenotype, and which is very common in Africa. So this pictorial representation, you can see the man here in purple has a A base at this position, whereas the man in blue has the same where G. And similarly, the man, this, this man in orange has T hair. So there is a single nucleotide polymorphism at the same position for different individuals. This is known as SNPs. So what are the molecular events that give rise to blood group antigen? It can be a single nucleotide polymorphism, which we have discussed, and this is responsible for blood groups like Kel, Duffy, JK, etc. Then you can have an inactivating mutations and deletions, uh, which can give rise to null phenotypes, especially in D. You can have an insertion in exon or nucleotide. You can have a single crossover or gene conversion like in MNS and partial D. So what are the techniques that are used to predict a blood group antigen? So generally we need to know where the SNPs are there and that's why you need to actually have a look at the conserved gene. That is the portion of the gene where actually a SNP is there. So this can, this is a simple, simple procedure and this can be done kit base, you have kits available for the same and you can run a PCR on the same, that is a polymerase chain reaction. Or in some labs which are very well versed with the same, they can design a primer to actually locate what conserved gene is absent or present. And this method is known as a homebrew method, which you can also do. So these are two methods which you can do on the conserved gene. So this is a very simple thing, but there is a caveat to it. Many a time this conserved gene will not represent phenotypically what is desired. And why this happens is you need to know a wider portion of the gene, not just the portion in which SNP is involved, because many a times a silencing mutation may occur from a region other than the conserved gene or the SNPs which we are looking out for. So whenever there is a silencing mutation, you need to do more of sequencing. And that is why you should, the best method is to go for sequencing of the whole region. And that is, you can do through two methods. There is a 
traditional method which is the sanger sequencing or the capillary based and a next generation sequencer which will actually sequence all the genes and all the genetic material with a very high throughput which is the uh, new tool in the uh, molecular blood grouping so since uh, many a lab would not be able to afford it you can have a regional center doing the sequencing and relatively medium based lab medium labs can you know actually go for a pcr based methods so in the pcr you can do a pcr rflp that is restriction fragment length polymorphism you can do an allele specific pcr you can do a real time pcr or q pcr and you can do a microarray technology which we'll be talking about briefly of course you can do a sequencing through a next generation sequencer or a capillary sequencer so genotype may not always reflect the phenotype so it's not like molecular genotyping can you know replace the phenotypic through the phenotypic representation through a hemoglutination test and example i've already given is because there may be some silencing change and this may happen in the region other than where there is the conserved portion for the single nucleotide polymorphism so this happens when if a gene is not expressed on his or her rbcs so you may anticipate that the gene is there but since the gene is silent it is not expressed now so that person could could produce an antibody if transfused with an antigen positive blood example in duffy typing you have in kid you have in rht and uh, in s as well so there are some genes or some blood group genes which may be silenced so you have to keep that in mind that molecular blood grouping is not the final answer so this is the bead chip te technology which we practice on the micro arrays so this is the application of micro beads these micro beads are nothing but synthetic beads of different colors carrying different oligonucleotide probes they are identified by fluorescence scanning on a solid phase and the alleles are distinguished by the dna extent. so this is how it looks like so you have encoded these which are functionalized later and then they are kept on a solid phase where they can be analyze through fluorescence on an automated reader or uh, even manually of course manually it is going to be very difficult so these bead chips are incubated and then you can analyze them through a software which can analyze them so this is uh, how it will look like there will be different color con configurations and uh, obviously you can't uh, uh, read them through your naked eyes but you can actually have a software which can actually read them and tell you which which of the genes are positive or negative so will molecular genetics replace serological methods for blood group in the future yes for many but it is not going to uh, you know replace it for rh or avo group because these systems are very complex they have complex molecular background there are silencing mutations so and serological tests are very quick easy cheap and accurate so it's not like you just have a technology you implement it you need to know the pros and cons of it and then actually you should go ahead and see what you can do so what is the role of molecular typing in patient diagnostic it is a uh, part of any antibody identification process especially when you have donor cells in the in the body and these cells will give you a, a mixed reaction and that is why you cannot you know go for the uh, the exact identification so how do you do that you have molecular phenotyping and then molecular phenotyping can predict which patient can or cannot respond or make antibodies so once that happens and you give a molecular uh, typed results then you can have better selection this when you have better selection you can give better transfusion requirement and reduce the transfusion requirement and also decrease the adverse events like trali and infectious diseases the second application would be when you have a antigen profile of the patient where no serological reagents are available sometimes you may have an antibody you may have detected an antibody like a dom block you do not have an anti sera for it or the, these are rare anti sera and these anti sera have an expiry they have a shelf life so once that happens they are going to expire and you cannot use it anymore and some some uh, reagents are not even available so in those cases it is worthwhile to go for a molecular genotyping many a time hemoglutination may results may not reflect the patient's true phenotype at all and this is uh, specially pertinent to chronically transfused patient like thalassemia mds sickle cell anemia etc so let's discuss few clinical scenarios in which molecular genotyping has been very helpful over the years. first is the 
variant D. Very important. Why? Because reduced expression of RHD when it occurs, it may be mistyped as RHD negative by standard serological methods, and that is why you may end up giving it as RHD negative. So molecular genotyping offer the only exact categorization of all weak D types. And we all know there are many types of weak D. Important among them are type 1, 2, 3. The weak D type 1, 2, and 3 are very important. And this type 1, 2, 3 is important. Why? Because if you have a type 1, 2, 3 weak D, then you have to be managed as an RHD positive. And this will rationalize the use of RHD negative stock unit. So if you see there is some amino acid changes in the RHD proteins, weak D if you see there is a quantitative difference, quantitative defect and in the intracellular and the cytoplasmic region, partial D on the other hand is on the extracellular portion and there is a DL or D elution. So these are the amino acid changes which, which will give a variant D. So what is the protocol once uh, weak D genotyping uh, has to be performed? So this is a simple method on the right side. You can see there is an image which shows the differentiation of type 1, 2, 3, weak D. And this is by SSP methodology. It's a PCR based method. Very simple. You have a DNA ladder on the right side from which you compare the base pairs and you can see which one is positive. Here you can see the type 3 is positive. Why do you need to go for uh, weak D genotyping is because it's, this is the algorithm for the same which has been uh, taken from Sander et al. So, for uh, when, we do, when would you, you know, give rogum to the RH negative females who have got RH positive uh, pregnancy? So how do you do that? It's when you do, when it is negative, when the female is RH negative, then she is a candidate for RH Ig and she should be given RH negative for transfusion. When she is a po positive RH positive, then she is not a candidate for RH Ig. The problem happens when there is a discrepant or inconclusive or there is strength of reaction is weaker than expected that is the serological weak D phenotype. So what you do is you send for RHD genotyping and why you need to do is you need to determine if they are type 1, 2, 3 or not. So if, sorry. So if they are type 1, 2, 3 obviously then you can determine that type 1, 2, 3 is considered as RH positive. And if it is not type 1, 2, 3, it is, uh, you can safely say that, okay, this is not RH, they are RH, they can be considered as RH negative and they may require a ROGAM. The second set of patients where it is very important is the sickle cell patients. Now, this is a very unique population. So even if you try, and why it is unique is because if you see, if you actually go for an antibody status of patients who are receiving transfusion even multiple transfusions and if they are not sicklers and you actually type 100 patients, you will see that only 4 to 5 percent will develop red cell antibodies. But in sickle cell population, if you do that, around 25 to 30 percent of patients will have red cell antibodies and these antibodies may be allo antibodies or an auto antibody. So they are more prone to develop allo and auto antibodies. With that, there are other problems like they can have a delayed hemolytic type reactions, they may have a hyperhemolysis syndrome and uh, you may have an iron overload problem. So all these things coupled together, this makes this population very unique. And that is why this population will benefit most from molecular typing as it allows for more extended antigen matching. Now the use of DNA approach is essential to identify the autoantibodies here and also to look for the underlying significant, clinically significant allo antibodies. Interestingly, more, many patients make RH antibodies here, and this happens even despite matching for the RH antigens, the complete matching by serology. This was very well explained by Chow et al. in 2013 in which you can see around for RH specificity around 38% of the patient, although they were complete matched serologically, they, they developed a RH antibodies. And this should not have happened and this has happened. Why? Because of some kind of a variant D. So the discrimination between weak D and partial D is very important and this is because carriers of partial D antigen may develop anti-D when transfused with D positive RBC unit. Also then phenotypically we need to know the Duffy B phenotype or uh, the genetic type why? Because phenotypically Duffy B patients, Duffy B negative patient can safely receive 
डफी वी पॉजिटिव आरबीसी विदाउट द रिस्क ऑफ एलोमिनाइजेशन so this is another article by dacasta dc and this was published in uh, 2013 which reemphasizes that molecular matching of red blood cell is superior to serological matching in sickle cell disease patients here another paper by dna array analysis for red blood cell antigen facilitates the transfusion support with antigen match blood in sickle cell patients and here based on the genotype they were able to predict the phenotype compatible donors third use is the warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia very important in warm aiha we are all used to warm aiha coming to our uh, the patient is there and then many a times we have to work up the patient for waiha and there we need to give many a time we have to perform the auto adsorption or allo adsorption elution studies and check for underlying allo antibodies but with no success sometimes because no matter what even if you do 3 4 uh, 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 auto or allo adsorption uh, still sometimes you are not able to check for the underlying allo antibody invariably the best match is the only blood available which is like not the, you somebody some people like to say it's least incompatible but uh, invariably best match is only available and that is why you need to do molecular typing which is the best option here. also sometimes you may have a combination of both auto and allo antibodies and that's why you cannot determine sometimes the actual allo antibody or give antigen negative unit so what this approach does is it reduces the risk of htrs it prevents further aluminization and improves the patient care by reducing work time and the number of tests performed the fourth scenario is when the patient has multiple allo antibodies sometimes you may see that patient has not just one antibody he may have four or five antibodies and you may not have an anti sera sometimes for one of the antibodies and the others you may have so in order to give the antigen negative unit you need you can do family studies you can check for database of genotype donor but this is not very practically possible the other method is you go for a molecular typing and why because in molecular typing you do not need rbcs for rbc genotyping and you can use a buffy coder wbc and you can safely you know do the molecular typing also the transfused cell will not interfere and therefore we could test patients who have been recently transfused here so this chart actually tells us that there are so many antigen system like lutran diago colton dombrock for which anti seras are not available usually and also these anti sera may actually expire some day and they are rare anti seras which will be seldom used and that is if they are if they are expired obviously then you can't use them and that is why molecular typing is the best method here so fifth scenario is when molecular typing is done for donors instead of patient here they can be used to type antigen antigen type the blood donors for transfusion and expand the pool of blood donors and this can be done through a microarray technology which has got very high throughput and you can do simultaneously so many donors or and this is also very helpful when the typing anti sera are not available or are weakly reactive or have expired so to identify the antigen negative donor which can be for dombrock a b j o a b v s other uh, antigens it is also used for better characterization of region red cell that are used for patient antibody identification and molecular typing of variant gene can also assist in resolving a serological investigation in blood donors so if you have to do a serological investigation itself like patient was uh, proportion of donors of abo subgroup who have been typed as group o or rhd confirmation is not there you can go for a molecular typing so i just briefly touched that you can have a genotype region red blood cell and antibody identification now this we can have we can we do not have an indigenous panel itself in india but suppose you want to expand the panel what is existing and you already have the serological uh, testing done for the same you can actually increase the panel by incorporating through molecular blood typing so the standard antigens can be there and you can club them with some genotype uh, alleles and this will make your antigenic panel or the region red cell panel very robust now use of these panel in routine testing is significantly improves the pre transfusion diagnostic extending the range of detectable antibody specificities this overcomes the limitation of serological typing 
caused by shortage and a limited number of licensed tests there are. The use of genotyping cell in antibody identification panel extends the range of detectable antibody specificity, accelerates the antibody identification and improves the pre-transfusion diagnostic. For patient and donor, you can also detect weakly expressed antigen sometimes and uh, example in a patient with a weakened expression of Duffy B antigen due to Duffy X phenotype, this patient will be unlikely to make antibodies. So you should know that there are some weakly expressed antigen you can do a molecular blood grouping for the same. The very important application in fetal uh, risk stratification and this is when we do a fetal genotyping for prediction of risk of HDFN or hemolytic disease of fetus and newborn. The criteria is the mother's serum should contain IgG antibody, the father is heterozygous so you can do a, a genetic uh, profile of the father for IRHD as well and uh, so if he is obviously homozygous he is going to give RHD positive to the baby. If he is heterozygous, he may, he may not. And it is also helpful to know the ethnic origin and we can test for both mother and father. So when there, whenever there is a D negative pregnant woman with anti-D, it is valuable to know the D type of the status because fetus D positive at risk and pregnancy should be managed appropriately. And you can do a fetus, if the fetus is D negative, obviously there is no risk and no need for intervention. And this you can do through amniocentesis or there is another technology that has come very recently that is cell-free maternal DNA which is non-invasive and therefore it is better and has got uh, uh, very good results with the people who are practicing it. Other tests on fetal DNA in maternal plasma is you can look for CAL, you can look for other RH antigens and look because they are capable of causing HDFA. So coming to the application of molecular typing in patients, you can do it in recently transfused you can in high prevalence antigen when there is a DAT or warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, patients receiving monoclonal antibody therapy, whenever there is a weakly expressed antigen to resolve some discrepancy, to look for an underlying allo antibodies when there is auto antibodies, type patient when anti sera is not available, has weak potency or has expired, in variant antigen, especially in RH and in sometimes in allogenic stem cell transplant. So thank you so much. I hope uh, you have understood the various applications, various uses of uh, uh, this molecular typing and how it is going to benefit us. But the crux and or the simple thing that you should remember after this lecture is that molecular genotyping has come. It is very important to have it and you know have it as an armamentarium in your uh, uh, in your test uh, kit. But most importantly, it is not going to replace the serological testing that we perform. It is only going to complement the same and wherever it is needed, you should do it. Thank you so much. If there is any comments or anything you want to ask, please feel free and uh, write it on the comment section and uh, happy learning to all of you. Thank you so much.